Welcome to resilient.com and uh, 2022, here we come. And today, my guest, I'm honored to have a Mr. Ian Schechter. And Ian, for those of you that don't know, was a, um, a pretty incredible driver back in the day in South Africa. He was uh, at least six time and as he would probably say nine times South African national drivers champion, depending on which categories you look at. And uh, Ian is... Uh, you know, most people say it's the old story. He was the son of so-and-so, the brother of so-and-so. And yes, he was a brother of a very famous world champion, but named Jody Schechter. But Ian himself was one hell of a driver. And uh, Ian spent, um, you know, a good 20 races or so in Formula One internationally on the Grand Prix circuit, competed in a lot of the South African Formula One championship um, has done multiple, multiple things in terms of motor racing, motorsport. And of course, the Schechter family, um, <clears throat> other than uh, Jody's huge success on the world stage, has always been successful because Ian was an incredible driver. Then uh, his son, Jackie, was amazing, won the Barber Dodge Series in America, was on the, you know, also on a, on a really great trajectory. And then, of course, his nephew or Jody's son, uh, Thomas, raced here in the IndyCar series and uh, had a couple of wins in IndyCar and uh, almost won the Indy 500 once upon a time. So Close. the cool thing about uh, chatting to Ian is, uh, you know, is about, you know, our side is about resilience and about perseverance. And in the day when Ian raced, mainly in the 70s in Formula One, it was one of the deadliest eras in uh, motor racing history. And um, back in the day, from the research I did, I think there was something like 12 drivers that died between 1970 and 1980. So, you know, it was even worse. And then in, uh, in the 80s, it dropped dramatically to only four drivers that year, luckily. But, but Ian, let's talk about um, going from uh, the hot seat into the fire. There you were arriving in Formula One. And uh, share with us a little bit about that experience going into a Formula One car for the first time and how crazy it was. Yeah, um, we had the petrol, we ran Formula 2 cars in 73. At the end of 73, we decided to challenge Charlton with Formula 1. Um, he was current champion, so Gunson bought two loads of 72s from the works team from Colin Chapman. The cars they actually ran for Ronnie Peterson and Emerson the year before. Um, but then we had the fuel crisis, and we weren't allowed to race or test so we had nothing we just sat idly till march i think at grand prix and that was the first time we were allowed to go out and i was strapped in the lotus and you must remember in those days we didn't have television yet so we didn't know about grand prix racing like today all we knew was the race once a year in south africa anyway i was sitting in the car waiting to go out and then they stopped practice and i asked ken house who was my manager then and he said Peter Revson had been killed. And that was on the first lap wow. uh, warm up. Something broke on the cart barbecue and he hit the arm go and caught fire and everything. And there I was sitting in the car. <laughs> uh, you know, we'd heard about Formula One, we'd heard about the dangers. And I was sitting in the car thinking, well, he did nothing wrong. I mean, I could be dead in 10 minutes' time. The only thing is I didn't have the balls to get out the car and go home, which is what I was wanting to do. But I, I got through the weekend and, um, you know, put it behind us uh, as you do once you're in the car and, you know, slowly built up. But uh, it was a little bit of a disaster. And from that point of view, mentally, and then, of course, not having driven a car before or tested it at all, um, it was brand new. But the car was fantastic. The Lotus 72 was probably the best car I ever drove. So, I mean, nowadays, these guys in Formula One, they get groomed, they go through all these series, come up the ranks, Red Bull Junior, this and that, whatever. And then they finally, you know, after usually doing pretty well in the Junior Series, get a, a test drive. There's no such thing as putting a guy in a Grand Prix car on the grid for his first outing, right? I mean, how crazy is that? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, these days they've got the simulators, which I believe are so real. Um, they almost 
like driving the car. So they learn the circuit and they get the feel of the car. Um, and they also, the good juniors, they get those Friday morning one hour mm. sessions, um, two or three a year. Right. Before they actually get the day testing as well, like after Abu Dhabi, those were junior drivers there. Right. So they get, they get a lot more uh, testing done than we did, you know, in our era. I mean, considering how dangerous it was in those days, I mean, Formula One's always been dangerous, but looking at the era that you raced, I mean, those statistics are pretty scary compared to today, where, you know, nobody's died since Jules Bianchi, you know, 10 years ago, or whatever it was. Um, yeah. How was the fear factor for you getting in a car like that, not really knowing, you know, the car that well and, you know, just having had somebody die, you know, in your, I mean, yeah. how did, how did uh, you cope with it? Well, I, I, it was whilst we were waiting to go out, it, it's a problem. But, you know, I always found that like every Saturday morning, I'd wonder, what am I doing at the track? I could be at the beach having a beer. Why am I here? But once you put your helmet on and strapped in and ready to go, everything disappears. And, you know, when you're in the car, mm -hmm. in our day, there was no radio. So that was fantastic. It was you and your two or three gauges that we had. And you did your own thing. And the only thing you got was your pit board, which could tell you very little. Mm -hmm. um, so it was actually a, a nice place to be. Uh, very peaceful. No outside worries, no troubles, no nothing. Um, and you didn't think of the, the scary parts, you know, when a, you just thought about staying on the tar, that's about it. Um, we also had curbs and gravel, so we had catch fences, which were very dangerous. But so we didn't uh, use these escapes like they do today, you know, we stayed. Right. And the curbs were um, restrictive that you don't just flat line them like they do today. If you right. take the apexes of the corners today, they all flat, other than a stupid sausage put every down then. <laughs> um, and the guys, I mean, where's the apex? It's anywhere within two meters, you know? Right. We had to be very specific. I mean, we had to be within a centimeter of the curb. If you clip the curb, it could upset the car and you couldn't yeah. ride over the curbs sort of thing. So. Yeah. So, why, so Ian, why do you, why were Formula One cars so lethal back in the day? I mean, we know some of that, but from your perspective, what made them so deadly in your era? Well, they were, first of all, only made out of aluminium and fiberglass. So when you hit something, I mean, the aluminium just folded. And the other problem we had was like with the Lotus 72, I'm not sure of the Tyrrell, but the 72 had two, I'm sure it was 100 litre tanks on each side of you. So you started the Grand Prix sitting in a bathtub of 200 liters of fuel. Uh, today, they only run 100 liters or 100 kilograms of fuel. I'm not sure what that is in liters. Um, and it's behind the driver in a safety cell. So uh, the fires in our era were a big problem. Uh, you know, Roger Williamson and Piers Courage and Bianca, uh, which is anyway, there were so many of them. Um, but that's why. So the cars were very fragile. Um, and when they broke, they broke. You know, today they've got that uh, carbon fiber like cell, mm -hmm. uh, safety cell. And they got much more. If you ever look, like okay, besides the uh, halo, you know, around the side of the car, that's just a fiberglass sheet. Whereas they've got very thick and padded and at much higher on the side. You can't see the driver anymore. So they're in a much safer situation. The right. cars were fragile, yeah. So what, and, and I mean, when you were a driver going out, what was your biggest fear in those days in terms of- No, just your opposition. <laughs> 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 you didn't really think about, you know, the cars felt great when you drive it. Uh, I drove the Tyrrell exactly 40 years later. Um, Johan Rupert owns the car today and I had a ride at Swan Corks and Cape Town, and Cape Town was fantastic because the car would pull 10,000 in top gear. When you're in the car, it feels so good and safe, you know? It's only when you hit something that it feels <laughs> <laughs> And And fortunately, I never crashed uh, any of the cars in South Africa. In one race, I spun once, but just harmlessly onto the edge of the track. Um, yeah. And, and what do you think, I mean, Comparing those days to nowadays, it's like, 
you know, is there, is there really a comparison when you look at today's cars and the sport of Formula One today versus your day? How does one even, you know, make sense of these two? For somebody that's grown up watching for Stoppen and Hamilton that didn't yeah. watch your era, how do you explain to them what it was like to drive in the 70s in Formula One? Well, in those days, there was uh, no, F there was FIA, but only the president, there were no stewards and race director, such as the clerk of the course. But you only got called up if it was something deliberate and absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the rest of the time, if you banged wheels and took a guy out, that was just no racing. But that, where that comes into play is that you didn't take people out on purpose because it would come back to haunt you, you know, karma <laughs> always comes around. And so in our day, because I guess it was dangerous and because we had more respect um, there was no runoff areas and stuff. We drove with uh, more sense than they do today. Um, I possibly think today, having the stewards and the rules and the penalties, they induce the problem. They, they, they create the problem going side by side through chicanes. Chicanes were always one line, you know. But now, because if you maybe have a half a nose ahead and you're on the wrong side, you still push your luck, you get pushed off, you cry on the radio, and the <laughs> other guy gets a penalty. You know, it's, um, we had to sort ourselves out. We had to sort our own brakes out. We had to sort our own tires during the race. We only had one set. So if you started to have a front tire problem, you'd manage it. If your brakes started getting hot, you'd have to manage it. You know, there was no computerized assistance from the pits. So do you think it's today, I mean, in your day, that it was more about driver skill and today there's much more team involvement in determining the outcome of these races? Yeah, um, I think it was all down to the driver. I would say the cars did play a part. There's no doubt that the Ferraris and McLarens were probably the best and Lotus occasionally and that. Um, but today you can see um, there's so much more to it. Um, uh, th there's all these computer what they sensors and they sensor with everything. So today I think they're more systems managers. Obviously the car still plays a big part. We've seen that with Lewis and Mercedes. Um, glad that Red Bull got the act together eventually this year. Next year obviously it should be exciting because they all brand new cars mm -hmm. and nobody knows who's going to but they were the best car. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say Driver played a bigger part in our time, but I don't think I could be a systems manager if I got into a modern car. If I looked at that steering wheel, I'd be totally confused. You know? Yeah, so it's like tech wizardry compared to the old days where you didn't have any of this yeah. stuff. It was very simple to drive, very purist, right? Well, it was still manual gearbox, clutch, manual brakes, no power steering. So <laughs> it was still heavy. What we didn't have, what they've got today, is the G-forces, you know, because they corner, they uh, stick to the ground so well mm -hmm. that they have a lot more G-forces. Mm -hmm. But I, I enjoyed our era because our cars would slide, and I loved driving the car with a bit of sideways, you know, it was <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the cars could handle it. The Lotus 72, for example, you could get it almost completely crossed up you could go off the circuit half crossed up but it will still come back on you know it was a great car uh that one the so tool was more yeah fine art to drive you had to be more perfect so getting back to those days um what were, of all the tracks you've driven in the formula one grand prix what was your favorite um well the tracks were different in our day you know silverstone they've messed up completely that'll tell me i'm talking rubbish <laughs> but you know they went and put at beckett's which was onto hangar straight for example hangar straight was a great passing straight now they can't pass even at drs because they've got a series of uh, sweeps before beckett's which means that the modern car falls back too far so they're hoping next year's cars will cure that problem so for me, I love Silverstone in our day. Woodcote was top gear, um, very fast corner. At the end of Hanger Strait, they were, the, all the corners were quick. Yeah. Um, I liked Silverstone, I liked Monza, which is the same today. Right. Um, Jacane might have been changed slightly, but the rest, uh, the, the corner I was thinking of yesterday was Parabolica. Yes, Monza. Parabolica. That's where they put the sausage 
and that uh, poor kid flew 30 feet in the sky, you know. Right. Um, so I like those circuits. Brazil was fantastic. It was double the size of Brazil today. Same wow. basic circuit, but double the length. Uh, we were doing two minutes 30. Now they're doing one minute eight, I think, or seven. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what else. I didn't get to race at uh, Nürburgring, thankfully. <laughs> and I didn't race at Spa. We raced Zolda that year. That was where okay. Villeneuve was killed. It wasn't a particularly nice track. Zolder was pretty good, uh, where they raced again this year, um, mm -hmm. up and won. That was a pretty good track. That was a lot like our tracks, you know, in South Africa. Right. So right. there were quite a few nice tracks, you know. Sweden was pretty good. Yeah. And Monaco, you did Monaco, right? I did Monaco, and in the wet second practice, I was fifth quickest. Not everybody went out. And then in the third practice, at the first sort of like left-right, in my day, they never had an escape road there. And when you locked up there, I went sideways into the armco right there and broke my ribs on my left-hand side. And I just couldn't drive off that. Now, Monaco runs very short gears. And with being thrust back like that with the broken ribs, it was impossible. I had to withdraw. Today, they've got an escape road there. And that's what most guys use. They hardly ever hit the barrier anymore. Was that they've opened up Monaco a lot from my day. Okay. You know, down the, out the tunnel, that whole area is cleaned up. They've changed the shape at the swimming pool and that. So it's a little bit more forgiving today than my day. Now, back, was that for you the most physical track because of the amount of gear shifts you had to do and all that stuff? It, it, was, it was. It was very tight. And the march didn't like to turn hairpins that, you know, you'd be full lock and you probably, you nearly had to do a three point turn, <laughs> put it that way. Wow. Um, and also the Monaco, it was my first time ever on a street circuit. And mm -hmm. obviously the arm coasts were very daunting compared to what I knew, you know? Yeah. yeah. Now you also spent some time, I mean, you drove for uh, Tyrrells and Marches and then also uh, Hesketh our, with our dear famous, infamous friend, James Hunt, who they made the movie about. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience driving uh, on James's team and that whole you know, mystique that the movie, if you probably saw the movie, you know, was it yeah, accurate? Did, was James really, you know, the guy yeah. that, you know, did all that stuff or was it, was he glorified by the media in your opinion? No, no, no. James was, he's the one champion that I've always said, enjoyed his championship to the full. He, <laughs> gave, he gave it, he was flat out. Um, but the whole experience was fantastic. They flew me over and then I went up to Hesketh Manor where they actually had the workshops. They converted the stables. I mean, it was all very beautifully oh. done, but I stayed at Hesketh Manor, and I mean, it was the most impressive home. Uh, it's one of those old English homes that have about four stories, and the landings are as big as my home, probably. <laughs> works of art and paintings. It was totally amazing. Um, and they were great people. Uh, I really enjoyed them. And then we were at the track. James was very helpful at the track. He took me around in a higher car. But you know, when you're not driving and you're in a higher car, it's very <laughs> different to a Formula One where you're sitting much lower and you're going five times the speed. Um, but James was wild. And then I remember what happened was we flew back from uh, Austria. The landing strip wasn't far away in a private jet, my first time in a private jet. <laughs> and we were flying back to London. And uh, James said to me, well, we're going down clubbing tonight, you know? I mean, this is after the Grand Prix, we're getting back to London at 11, 12 at night. Are you coming? And I was quite a nervous youngster then. And I said, no, James, I think I'm tired. I'm going to go home. And I didn't go with them because I'd heard all the stories and I really didn't want to get involved in what was going on. <laughs> um, but uh, he was a super guy. And then uh, I was lucky enough he lived about a block from Jody in Spain, and I spent a week with Jody in Spain. And James and his that present wife, Susie, who then married uh, Richard Burton, wow. they came over for dinner and played cards. And um, yeah, he, he was uh, what he was. And, and two other stories, and one is sort of not such a good story. <laughs> he was racing in Spain, I think it was, and there was a young girl chasing him the whole weekend. And his car broke down, I think, on the sixth lap. And the team told me by the seventh lap, he was in the back of the transporter with the girl. And 
in the, I was at the counter checking in in uh, Argentina, and a young girl came up there with an envelope and said, "Can I have James' room number?" They said, "Well, we can't give it out to you." So she said, "Well, will you put, give this to James?" And I knew what it was. It was probably pictures of her and a phone number and making an arrangement. And there was another story with him and the singer in the band in a band break the night before the Grand Prix. But anyway, that's, he he was like he was, and Nicky was also played extremely like he was. Nicky was very straight and reserved, and uh, he wasn't a flamboyant guy like uh, James. You know, so the the Rush movie played it extremely well. Why was James so good? What made him so good? I don't know, because, you know, in the junior formula, he didn't really do a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he had to miss a Formula 3 race and March phoned me and asked me if I would race in his place. I can't remember what race it was going to be. Um, so I, all I had to do was find an engine. So I went to the engine builders, Hull Bay and whoever they were. And both of them said to me, Ian, we can't give you an engine because we know for a guy like you, because Jody had set the precedent the year before, we have to give you one of our specials and we don't have a spare special. <laughs> so the customers were getting customer engines and if you were going to supposed to win or whatever, and, and so I didn't do the race. So there was something going on with James at March that they were looking to try somebody else. But the minute he got into Formula One, um, he started to be good. Um, I don't think the speed feared him or the power feared him because I still remember one time they were saying, we sh should we give the cars more power? And he was shouting, yes, yes, yes. And I was thinking, hell, they got enough power, you know? <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, that's funny. So, Ian, you had such an incredible, uh, successful, you know, racing career in South Africa. Obviously, Formula One, you went there and it's more challenging when you're not in a top team. Um, you know, you... Why was it that Jody ended up winning a world championship and you guys were probably, I mean, some would say you're as good, if not better, a driver than your brother. Was it just opportunity and timing? I mean, what do you put that well, down? I really believe if the Heskett didn't blow up on the first lap, as that work, they don't normally blow up. Those cars were still extremely reliable. In fact, that was the only one I ever had engine failure with. Um, that weekend, as it so happened, uh, the race... There was a lot of breakages and stopping, you know, I think only about seven or eight cars finished. So I would have had a great weekend if I could have got into the race, even if I got in in last position. And that was my real opportunity. Then Frank Williams got hold of me the next year, but Frank's cars were really terrible in those days. But <laughs> Frank had no money. Um, his latest development was the old Hesketh nose cone. Oh. And the, the rose joints wore out. You'll know what rose joints are. The mechanics were told to go to the rubbish bins and get all the old McLaren and Ferrari rose joints and choose wow. the best ones. Yeah. And, and the transporter was filthy. And he was running from the sheriff from month to month. So you couldn't buy anything <laughs> that fully. It was really a tough time for Frank. And I did two Grand Prix for him, um, both okay. Um, but then he asked me to come back to France and stupidly, I think because I was spoiled in South Africa, you know, I had a great car. Ken House was my mechanic who went on to NASCAR, won 11 championships at NASCAR, which wow. is probably a record. Yeah. Um, he was fantastic. So I had the best mechanic. I had a great car, um, Lotus and then a Tyrrell. I never got those cars for the Grand Prix. Wow. For example, there's this Tyrrell here in 76, that car now, the number 32, was two years old already. And I qualified one position behind Jody, only 0.1 of a second slower than him. So I think if I had have had a chance in the top team, that would have been good. I mean, look at Jill Villeneuve. He came to South Africa and we beat him here quite easily. And he got into Ferrari, crashed the car in the second Grand Prix. I was beating him in the first Grand Prix. Lauda stepped out. He won the championship in Canada was Villeneuve's home Grand Prix. I out-qualified him and he was behind me right until I had, a, I don't know it was tire trouble or what I had. I had a problem, I had to come in the pits. But he then went on to Japan and had that big crash when he ran into back of Ronnie Peterson, killed, I think, two Japanese marshals. But he had the off-season where they gave him 10,000 miles to test, you know, and 
That's the big difference. And then I, my next best opportunity was 76. Lotus offered me four Grand Prix, but I had committed to race for Lexington. And JPS was opposition to Lexington, to Rupert, and I'd given my word. And I, they'd been so good to me for all those years, I couldn't really um, accept the Lotus thing. But that would have been great because that was the year that Gunnar Nilsson came into the team in Mario. And Gunnar, I think, actually won a race. He won in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So that would have been a great opportunity. But, I, you know, I missed it. So I never really got into a top team to show or test. Uh, in March, I raced against Ribeiro, who, Alex Ribeiro, the Brazilian, and I was quicker than him at every single Grand Prix. Um, I qualified him every Grand Prix. I think he only qualified for two races. Because you remember in the 70s, there were 35 cars no. and only 25 made the grid. So on Friday, 10 cars got dropped out and I made it into the top 25 every single race. No. So, and he was, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the, other, uh, the other Brazilian, uh, Gunnar Nilsson, I mean, Swedish guy. He was his big opposition in Formula 3 and nearly beat him in the championship. So, and he went on to win a Formula 2 race at Nürburgring, so he was, couldn't have been too bad. Um, but, you know, in March, you were like today, if you are in a Haas, not quite as bad as a Haas. I suppose if you were in a Williams today, yeah. that's what it was like in the cars I drove. So, George Russell was fantastic in Formula 2. He won eight round races that year. Norris only won one in the same season. So, you know, he got picked up. And these junior teams... Obviously, like uh, Red Bull, have got nine juniors now this year um, coming through the ranks. So, so, Ian, so back at March, there was something like five drivers. Did you have five cars racing in the team? At no, March? no. What, the, what happened with March, unfortunately, was they sold cars to the public. Uh -huh. to the, yeah, so Brian Hinton had a car, Mazzaria had a car. Patrick Neve and Williams had a car. We beat them all the time. Okay. There, there were so there were so many, but the trouble is they were old models already. Oh, wow. uh, I'll, be, I'll give you an example. Uh, I used to live near Herbie Blash. Herbie Blash was the team manager of uh, Brabham for Bernie in those right. days. Mm -hmm. So because we flew from uh, Gatwick most times, and I was two blocks away the team bus would pick me up. So I would travel down to the airport with them. And Gordon Murray was a designer then, South African, as you know. Yeah. And we were chatting and he said to me, he said, Ian, we've already changed the rear suspension on our car three times this year. <laughs> I said, well, we haven't changed anything. So um, the tires just didn't work for us. Yeah. The other problem was he had, and I found out later, is we all ran good years, right? And they were all supposed to be the same, same number, same everything. And there was a guy, Bert Baldwin. He had a smiley badge on his chest. When you went to Bert and asked him questions about tires, he just pointed to the smiley chest. But uh, 1984, when I went to race with Saul in America, he was now chief of Yokohama and we were running Yokohama race tires. And I said, Bert, sit down. I want to know the truth now. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, yeah, no, the tires weren't the same. The top teams got better tires than you guys did, although the numbers were the same. Anyway. Uh, Ian, yeah. share, share with us the story of resilience. I mean, we're all about resilience. In, in F1, in your career, there must have been days when you had to dig deep, whether it was mentally, physically, or whatever. Can you share with us a story of yeah. where you really had to, you know, dig for it? Yeah, well, the when I first got into F1, I got at the Grand Prix, and um, you can actually see Charlton was behind me. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, the car was so nice to drive that, you know, uh, you just had to... Okay, so what happened was we, we started the local season, we were running Firestone uh, because of team connections, and we had been running Firestone in Formula 2. But I found out that Halfway through the race, because our races were half the length of the Grand Prix, they were quite long. Halfway through the race, the rear tires were knackered. Now, I don't know if that was me overdriving, because I love to go sideways, um, but I could lead and I, I could go okay, but I couldn't finish. So, halfway through the year, I said to Ken, Let's go, Goodyear. We've got to try it out. Charlton's on Goodyear and he's not having problems. 
And for the last six races, I won five of the six on the good years. They lasted and it was such a pleasure to drive. Um, the, but the first time I beat Charlton, that was probably when I had to dig the deepest because I had pole, but he was never more than this distance of the picture in the background of you behind me. And so you had to be perfect. You couldn't make a mistake. You couldn't lock up. You couldn't break too early or anything. It was at Maritzburg, a tight circuit. And uh, he was there right till the last lap, you know, and uh, that was probably the deepest I had to dig to make sure. Um, in Formula One, the worst experience I ever had was driving in the March Porsche with Sorrel at uh, Road America. That's a real driver circuit, a long circuit, very tough. I hadn't done the practice in the car and I hadn't uh, driven the circuit. And it was a monster to drive. It was like racing a Putco bus <laughs> with no aircon, no power brakes, no power steering, manual gear shift. Uh, I died in that. Well, I literally died in that car. Mm. My hands were full of blisters. My feet were full of blisters. It was just really tough. That was the hardest. And then I, I couldn't handle it. So I came in and gave the car back to Cyril to his disappointment. Then they put me back in the car later in the race. It was endurance. And my feet were burning. I couldn't work out what was going on. And I radioed the team and said, look, I can't put my foot on the brake pedal. Every time I touch it, my foot's on fire. They said, well, you're not coming in. You're staying out. You've got seven more laps. So <laughs> it was tough. Yeah. It Ian, what, some incredible stories, no doubt. What, what advice would you give these kids today? I mean, you had a son that you groomed for, you know, yeah. potential Formula One. It didn't work out. But these young kids that are watching the Verstappens nowadays, what advice would you give them in terms of getting up in Formula One? It seems so far away today. It, it, it is. The, look, first of all, you've got to have a wealthy father because <laughs> all, these, all these guys are starting at four or five years old. So when your kid comes to you and says, Dad, I want to be the next center, you've got to decide, are you going to spend this big money or are you going to buy a set of golf clubs or a tennis racket or a rugby ball? Mm -hmm. So you've got to have that kind of luxury behind you growing up. Um, but once they, they seem to get to a point now where they're in Formula 4, Formula 3, then these uh, Red Bulls, the Ferraris, the Mercedes, they all got junior teams. I think most of them, I don't know if Haas has, Williams certainly has. Mm -hmm. um, they've all got junior teams. And as I said, uh, Red Bull have got nine. So the chances of being like Jody and I were, and when my son raced overseas, of being picked up by the sponsors, that would help. But what I would have said before all these junior teams, I would have said to any kid, if your father or your sponsor can't get you to Formula One, don't bother going overseas from South Africa because it's just too expensive. You know, it's just all about the money. That's why you mentioned my son, Jackie. I mean, he won here in South Africa absolutely easily, won the championship whilst he was still at school and he won the Barber Dodge and he was quickest in their Barber Dodge shootout. Um, but the next level was Indy Lights. And he did three Indy Lights races. His first Indy Light race, he was quicker on the grid than Tony Kanaan and Helio castro Nevis, who turned out to be IndyCar superstars. But he outqualified them in a bad car halfway through the year. But they wanted a million dollars to do a season. And even then, it was six to one. It was still six million rand. And I went to Vodacom, MTN, Sassel, the government itself, uh, Steve Tretto was the Minister of Sport. He comes from my home, my home area. So we tried. We just couldn't find the money. And I then paid two um, uh, scouts in America to try and find him money. That cost a fortune, and they never found the money. So he had to come home. Yeah. All about uh, scouts in America to try and find him money. That cost a fortune, and they never found the money. So he had to come home. Yeah. All about the bucks. The Formula One drivers today. I mean, I think that Perez is, uh, I think he's sponsored by Slim, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and that multi billionaire Mexican. How much was that? I believe $20 million. Stroll paid $80 million to Williams to put his kid in the car for a year. Um, there's a lot of guys paying in big bucks, and they got sponsors. Um, that's our Kubica. Or however he pronounces yeah, that. Yeah. He had a bit of a budget. Um, he's still there, hanging around the reserve driver, probably paying. 
Um, so it's yeah, all about so, the money. It's all about the money. So who's the best driver today, Ian? Who's your favorite? Today, I, I look, uh, I think the way uh, Max drives is the way you're supposed to race, you know? That's real racing. Unfortunately, the DRS and the cars they've had for the last 10 or 15 years, whatever it was, they don't work. You know, Kalami used to be, the old Kalami was a fantastic Formula One race track because you had the whole back section to try and be quicker than the guy in front of you. Right. Come out of the Eurocorp a meter or two behind him and you knew you had the toe. With a modern Formula One car, you would have probably lost two seconds on the back section. You wouldn't have made it up on the straight. So this is racing. I mean, uh, up till now, if you look at Lewis, he's mm -hmm. only had to pass people in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And once or twice, he's tried to go with Max in the corners. He either put Max in the wall or Max landed on top of him or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, so... Uh, I like Max's driving. Uh, you know, Ricardo drove like that when he was at Red Bull. He would dive bomb everybody. He hasn't had the brakes right at McLaren for his liking, so he's not doing it. Um, Lando Norris drives differently. He drives like Prost, you know, solid, quick, fast. But uh, Max drives like Ayrton. Um, where there's a gap, he goes for it. And he's caught such car control absolute he's like mark marquez on motorbikes you know yeah. i've never seen a guy on bikes because i raced bikes for four years and watch mm -hmm. every motorbike race mm -hmm. rossi's fantastic and Duan was fantastic and agostini halewood was probably the best but marquez has got more bike control than anybody and max is the same if you take away the pranks max had which was fourth caused by lewis in the one and i think by bottas hitting a McLaren and taking him out in the other at Hungary. He didn't make any mistakes, really, you know? Um, That's so, good. Well, we'll see 2022. Here we come. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think George will be very, very good in the, okay. the CD. He proved that already, you know? Yeah. Um, so who's so your money on? Who's your money on for 2022? Max. <laughs> I think so, because... They've got Adrian Newey, and you know he's won championships at three different teams, so he knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't think Honda, although they've pulled out, I don't think they've pulled out, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're still going to be coaching uh, Red Bull on building the engines and updates or whatever they allowed. Um, so I think that they'll produce a good car. The series will produce a good car. McLaren and Ferrari are bragging like hell. So I think between those four teams, I don't know who's going to be. But Max, I think, is the quickest driver at the moment. Yeah. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Thanks thanks for sharing those wonderful anecdotes about the past and some of your yeah. stories. It's fascinating to talk to a guy that drove the real cars, as we used to call them, <laughs> and uh, not some of the modern clinical stuff. I know it's very different, but it's still cool to hear some of those perspectives. And we wish you well for this year and we will be in touch soon. So thanks for your time. Thank you for the interview. And